on a booktube and author tube talk about traditional publishing versus self-publishing versus indie publishing. And when we discuss all the different ways there are out there to get our books into the world, there is one key piece that I never hear anyone talking about. I want to fix that because I believe that this concept gives us the best possible look into the future of where indie books and publishing trends at large are going next. I've said a lot of things in the past about how the line between traditional publishing and self-publishing is blurring. I don't believe in the distinction between traditional publishing and self-publishing. In this video, I intend to prove that publishing is a spectrum. I started thinking about like, what if I'm taking his advice and I apply it to my difficulty deciding about traditional publishing versus indie publishing versus self-publishing versus hybrid path. And you know what? I realized I don't give a fuck. Here's an example. I own my own business. I produce books, stuffed animals, t-shirts, merchandise, other products, all related to the same real rescue dogs whose stories I'm sharing. Sometimes people ask me if my books are traditionally published or self-published. Nobody asks me if my stuffed animals or my t-shirts or any of my other merchandise are traditionally published or self-published. Like, if Jane down the street started making her own candles and she started up the small candle business and then was competing with Yankee Candle and then went to craft fairs or whatever, people wouldn't be like, oh, those are self-published candles. Like, no, that's a small business that's growing. I don't see why it has to be any different with books. It's time to stop dividing the entire concept of books, which at their core are a way to share ideas and stories with others into a strict binary. It's time that I elaborate on why I believe that this line is disappearing, using details, research, and evidence from throughout history. Today, I'm gonna show you how the past hundred years show a shift in the way we consume media, and how this shift is leading to more options for creators and consumers alike than ever before. This is the evolution of narrowcasting. small business supporters. I'm Savvy, back with another video not just about books and writing, but about media at large. If you're new to my channel, welcome! Nice to meet you! Please leave a comment below introducing yourself, I'd love to be friends. And please subscribe to this channel! I have new videos coming out about books and writing every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 11 a.m. Central. Please remember to ring the notification bell so that you don't miss any updates about new videos. Today, we're going to be discussing the concept of narrow casting. We're going to dive deep into what this term means means, look into its history and how it's affected the consumption of media over the past century, and finally use it to predict what this could mean for the industry of publishing, whether traditional or indie or self-publishing, what this could mean for the future. Just so you know, all the research that I used for this video will be linked in the description below, so feel free to check out any of those sources if you want to do further reading on this topic. Also, because I'm not Rachel Hollis, I like to give credit when I quote someone else. So first, what does narrow casting mean? Narrow casting is kind of like broadcasting, but it's also kind of the opposite. While the term broadcast has been around since the 18th century, the earliest terms of the use of the word narrowcast dates back to the 1920s. One of the first instances I could find using the word narrowcasting was from the Evening News of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania on December 8th, 1922. It read, Narrowcasting refers to the use of local light and telephone lines to bring to the homes concerts and other forms of entertainment sent on high frequency waves. According to the nerdiest of all sources, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, when the term narrowcasting first appeared in the 1920s, it was defined as radio or television transmission aimed at a narrowly defined area or audience. However, more modernly, that definition has changed to to aim a broadcast at a narrowly defined area or audience. No longer does it have to be a radio or television transmission, especially since nowadays a lot of our media is consumed on the internet. Presently, Wikipedia defines narrowcasting as aiming media messages at specific segments of the public defined by values, preferences, demographic attributes, and or subscription. Subscription, huh? Help me narrowcast, friends! Subscribe to my channel! Now, there has been a lot of academic research done on how the concept of narrowcasting, especially in the age of the internet, is affecting not only creators and consumers, but also the dissemination of political messages and the strategies used in targeted online advertising. However, 
I don't feel educated or well-informed enough about those last two to really delve into those in this video. So instead, I'm going to focus today's video on the effects of narrow casting solely on content creators and their audiences, such as my fellow authors, my fellow YouTubers, and everyone who watches us. Specifically, I'm going to be focusing on entertainment. When Telecommunications Weekly used the term narrow casting on September 7th, 2016, they said, the present invention can be said to microcast or narrowcast the content of personalized song lists to individual stations or users. We're now starting to see the concept of narrow casting play out in our music tastes. If you took a trip back to the 1960s, who was the most popular musician? Don't think too hard about it, it's the Beatles. That is not a matter of opinion, it, it was the Beatles. Well, what about the 70s or 80s? Well, we had Michael Jackson, we had Madonna, we had David Bowie. In the 90s, you either liked Nirvana or you liked NSYNC, but everyone liked Beyonce. And now, in the post-internet age, who is the artist that defines us? It's a trick question, there isn't one. Everyone you ask will give you vastly different answers on this. When we started getting musicians promoting their content on MySpace and on Bandcamp, it suddenly became cool to like musicians that no one had ever heard of before. This became sort of a hipster chic type of trend. Nobody wanted to just take what the mass media was giving them at face value. We wanted more. We wanted to discover the other artists that were out there that might be more specifically what we personally were looking for. And the internet allowed us to do that. By broadening the definition of narrowcasting to include all media, we can look at how this concept affects not only television and radio, but also movies, music, television and books. Now, how has the internet affected the consumption of media on a grand scale? Well, we just talked about music, so let's talk about movies. The Hollywood industry presently is, to put it nicely, a dumpster fire. Disney basically just bought out everything, and now we have options including Star Wars and Marvel and Star Wars and weird remakes of somewhat photorealistic looking lions and Star Wars and not Spider-Man, but more Star Wars. It's no wonder that people are starting to look outside of movie theaters and major studios mass distribution to take in the majority of their content. Now that's not to say that these big movies don't still make money. They make a ton of money and a ton of people still see them but it's not the only thing they're watching. In the 1950s, if you wanted to see a movie, you saw the movie that the movie studio wanted to give you. Now, Year-round, all parts of the world are filled with film festivals. Streaming services like Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime are putting out their own original movies as well. And we can't forget that there are independent filmmakers right here on YouTube and also on sites like Vimeo creating their own projects and putting them out into the world either for a Patreon donation or some ad revenue. But you won't find those smaller movies if you don't want to see them. If you're interested in mumblecore indie stuff, you take your ass to the film festival. If you're interested in YouTube, you log on to YouTube. That's narrowcasting. You, as an audience member, find the media that is most specific to what you want in that moment. While Disney movies and Star Wars movies can be considered a form of broadcasting and indicative of the older way of doing things that is still thriving and will not die anytime soon, it's never again going to be your only option. So after talking about movies, let's kind of talk about TV now. Back in the 90s, TV was essentially an oligopoly. ABC, CBS, and NBC owned everything. Those companies used TV as a medium to broadcast. Everyone got the same TV. Did you watch TV in the 90s? Congratulations, that means you watched Friends. Or maybe you watched Seinfeld, and you probably watched Full House. Now what do we watch on TV? Whatever the fuck we want! Some of us watch Netflix original series. Some of us watch shows on Hulu or Amazon Prime. Some of us paid for CBS All Access, but most of us choose instead to just believe that Discovery is not a part of the canonical Star Trek universe. So for me, what do I mostly watch? I watch YouTube. I watch you guys. I watch my friends talk about books. I watch my friends give me writing tips and vlog about their writing processes and I gain interest in their books. I do also watch some big YouTubers, but a lot of people that I idolize as celebrities are also people that the majority of my friends or family have never even heard of. For example, my favorite large YouTuber of all time is Mike Staclasa from Red Letter Media. Their channel has over 1 million subscribers and makes a full-time income based on 
videos and Patreon income alone. Another huge YouTuber I like is Hila Klein because she's one of my fashion icons. When I tell people that I'm a fan of these people, and probably to a lot of you guys watching as well, half the people will be like, who? I don't know who you're talking about. How is that person famous? I've never heard of them. And then a small segment of people will also be like, OMG, yes, I stan. It wasn't like that in the 90s. In the 90s, everyone liked Bob Saget. Or maybe you hated Bob Saget, but everyone knew about Bob Saget. And don't get me wrong, Bob Saget is a cool dude but he's not the only dude. However, the majority of things I like to watch are people like you guys who are likely watching right now, people who have channels about the same size as my small channel, people who have the ability to create things and put their message and their thoughts out there into the world, and other people will find it without any strict barrier to entry. Because of narrow casting, I can find creators who are producing exactly what I'm looking for, instead of relying on a mass media broadcast and just hoping for the best. So let's talk Talk about radio. Arguably, radio was one of the initial iterations of the term broadcasting, as well as the place that the concept of narrowcasting was born. Local radio has been a great place for people to start gaining followings on a smaller and more local scale, just as the concept of narrowcasting would imply. And radios are still great. I was on the radio once and it was one of the best experiences of my life. I made a video about it. You can check that out linked in the cards. But now we have even more options. If you like listening to the radio, but you want to listen to more than the radio, you can listen to a podcast. Podcasts get very specific. Some people like true crime podcasts. Some people like writing tips podcasts. Some people like radio drama podcasts. Some people like comedy style podcasts. Some people like podcasts about TV shows or pop culture. But anyone is able to start a podcast and anyone is able to listen to anyone's podcast as well. Over the years, podcasts have become more common and so has the practice of people creating content around specific specific niches. So what does all of this mean? It means that the indie band who sells their music online for a suggested $5 donation is never going to be as rich as the Beatles, but they are going to make money playing music. And a YouTube comedian with a moderately sized audience is never going to have the reach of someone like Jerry Seinfeld, but they are going to have an audience. Basically, the concept of celebrity has been redistributed. Instead of only a small percentage of people getting to have everyone at once as their audience, a lot of people get to have smaller segments as a dedicated following. That's narrow casting. So what does that mean for books and for authors? We always hear about building your author platform. I mean, that's a huge part of the reason why I'm on BookTube and AuthorTube. Other than the fact that I love making videos and I love this community, there's a lot of reasons, but the author platform is definitely one of them. Some of you guys read my books and enjoy them. Some of you have never heard of me, but honestly, that's where the blurring of the publishing paths comes in. Here's my book, Beauty King. I self-published this. Here's my book, Sculpt Yourself. I published this with my friend Small Press that she set up using print-on-demand services and ISBNs from Boker. Here's my Forever Home Friends series. This is a business I started myself which produces books in addition to stuffed animals and other types of merchandise. Some of you have read these books. Some of you have told me in emails, in reviews, in videos, in comments, how much you enjoyed them and what they meant to you. But the majority of the world has never heard of any of these books nor have they heard of me. And I'll be honest, until I joined BookTube, there were a lot of very famous best-selling authors that I hadn't heard of. And that's primarily because I don't read fantasy, but I gotta be honest with you guys and I need you to not kill me for this, but I'd actually never heard of authors like Sarah J Maas or Leigh Bardugo until I started watching a ton of booktube videos. And that's because their books just weren't my thing, so I was never in a lot of spaces that would promote those things to me. You know what came out in the 90s? Harry Potter. You know what everyone and their mom knows about? Harry Potter. Will we ever see a craze like Harry Potter again in the future? I don't know. Maybe. But based on this trend of narrow casting, what I think we will start to see more and more of is authors finding their correct target audience and then selling them not millions of books, but maybe hundreds or thousands of books. Most of us will never be JK Rowling. I will take a bet right now that absolutely nobody watching this video, and that's myself included, obviously I'm included in this whole mass of us I'm talking to right now, none of us will ever become millionaires from writing. Now, if you are a millionaire, please feel free to correct me in the comments below. Also, nice to meet you. But I bet that a lot of us 
will find an audience who's interested in our books and will pay for them. And for that concept alone, your publishing path doesn't matter. Now, disclaimer, that's not to say that your publishing path doesn't matter at all in terms of your personal priorities. Obviously, there are considerations for you to take regarding how much of your marketing you want to do, how much creative control you want, what type of way you want your book to be put out there and received, and where you want it to be sold and all of that. But that is a completely different topic for a different day. Today, we're talking about narrow casting. You know what's narrow cast? Your Amazon buyer recommendations. The millions of books you can choose to download onto your e-reader or download through Kindle Unlimited, the books you find here on YouTube or on Twitter or through social media. In the past, books, much like TV and other forms of media, had a large barrier to entry. Instead of studios, however, we had expensive printing technology. New advents like print on demand are increasing our ability not only to self-publish books, but also to start our own businesses without having to have the giant startup capital required to either purchase printing equipment or outsource books to be printed in bulk somewhere else in a large quantity. And this is what allows small businesses to enter the game. For example, you all know I started a small business with Forever Home Friends. For my initial printing run, I used print on demand to print the number of copies I needed based on my pre-orders from Kickstarter. Kickstarter, by the way, is yet another form of narrow casting since people can choose projects to support financially through sorting based on their own interests. You can work with the small press, you can self-publish, you can pitch to an you can do whatever the fuck you want, I don't care. No matter what, you're probably not gonna become a millionaire. But for real, who goes into writing for the money? In terms of finding your audience and getting your words to the people who need to hear them, your publishing path is irrelevant. So this is why I believe the lines between different paths of publishing are gonna get blurrier and blurrier until they eventually either disappear or just stop mattering entirely. Consumers are purchasing not based on what the most popular or available thing is. They're buying based on what best matches their specific interest and narrow casting and the internet are allowing this to happen. Regardless of what you create or how you create, I truly believe that now is a better time to be a creator than at any point before in history. And I also predict that it's only gonna improve more and more as time goes on. Originally, I wanted to give this video as a TED Talk, but I applied to give a TED Talk with it and it got rejected. Do you wanna see me go more into this topic as a TED Talk? If so, I've also linked the TED Talk nomination thing below. So um, nominate me for a TED Talk if you wanna see that because I'm very passionate about this topic. If you couldn't tell, let me know your thoughts on narrow casting in the comments below. I would love to start a discussion on this topic. In the meantime, since you're already on my channel, which narrow casting allowed you to find in the first place, feel free to check out my novel Sculpt Yourself, linked in the description below, and to check out my small business, The Forever Home Friends, which is a series of books and plushes based on real rescue dogs, and 10% of all of our profits go to benefit animal shelters. Thank you so much for watching. I will be back on Monday with another video for you guys. But in the meantime, don't forget to support small businesses. Have a great weekend, friends.